This week we have another double parsha, Parshas Behar and Parshas Bechu Kosai. Parshas Behar has a brisk 57 verses, and the parsha begins with the laws of the Shemitah. Shem spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come to the land that I shall give you, when you come to the land of, of Israel, land of Canaan, the land shall observe a Sabbath rest for God. For six years you sow your field, for six years you prune your vineyards, for six years you gather in your crop, for six years you participate in the agricultural activities, but on the seventh year it should be a complete rest, you don't sow your field, you don't prune your vineyards, you can eat the aftergrowth, but you can't reap it, and you have to set aside the grapes, you don't pick the grapes, it should be a year of rest for the land, just like we have in our weekly schedule, six days we work, the seventh day is Sabbath, is Shabbat, we're off. Similarly for our fields as well, the six years of work and the seventh year you are off. Now this law begins with an interesting preamble. Hashem spoke to Moses, saying is the most common verse in the Torah. Here we have that verse with a few extra words. Hashem spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, we are giving the location, the latitude and longitude of this instruction. Why are we giving the location of this statement? Now, in fact, they have not left Sinai since they arrived at the foot of the mountain in chapter 19, verse 1 of the book of Exodus. So essentially for 22 chapters in Exodus and 24 chapters in Leviticus, they haven't left Sinai. So for 46 chapters, they've been in the same location. And somehow over here, there is a need to tell us the location of this particular instruction. So Rashi tells us a very interesting idea. What's the connection between the laws of Shemitah, between the laws of the Sabbath of the land and Mount Sinai? After all, weren't all the laws given to us at Sinai? Why is this one singled out? So Rashi explains because just as with the laws of Shemitah, the general concept and the details and the particulars of the laws were conveyed at Sinai, so too with all the mitzvahs, the general concept and the particulars and the details of the laws were also given at Sinai. Now Rashi elaborates that in the book of Deuteronomy, and really from the beginning, from the middle of the book of Numbers, the Jewish people are encamped at the Arvos Moab in the plains of Moab. And there, the repetition of the Torah, the Deuteronomy, the Mishnah Torah is is given. And there's many mitzvahs that are, are, are said twice. They're said once, so to speak, at Sinai, and repeated again in the complete retelling of the Torah in the plains of Moab. Whereas Shemitah, it appears only here, but it's not repeated in the plains of Moab the second time the Torah is repeated. And therefore, we can deduce that clearly all the laws are taught at Sinai because they're not repeated. And therefore, the laws of Shemitah are presented as the evidence that it, everything was set at Sinai, some things were repeated, some things were not repeated. That's what Rashi explains. Now, I think there's a, a question that sort of speak, uh, persists. You know, there's a, an important lesson that we be told that all of Torah, not just the general concepts, but also the details, the particulars of the mitzvahs, were conveyed at Sinai. But why specifically is the law of Shemitah used as the stand-in to convey this important piece of information. After all, we could have been taught like in the laws of the mezuzah or the tzitzis or the red heifer, the paraduma or Shabbos. There's many other laws that could have been labeled, oh, this was told to Moses at Mount Sinai and this law, this insight that all the mitzvahs were given at Sinai, not just the general concepts, but the details and all the particulars were given at Sinai with all their minute details. Why specifically is the law of Shemitah presented as the stand-in for all the mitzvahs to convey this important insight. So I think there is a valuable lesson here. You know, the general notion of a moratorium, of of a sabbatical, it kind of exists in our world. You have an academic, a professor, and they work for six years, and they take a year off to, to, to study, to ruminate, whatever it is, to write a book. That's not an unusual thing. Journalists do it. And by the way, fields do it as well if you're a farmer. It makes sense that the fields need some time to replenish the resources. It's not uncommon notion, even today, 
to allow a field to lay fallow for a while, to allow it to rebuild and replenish and resupply itself with nutrients. The difference is that you don't have a university where all the professors all take a sabbatical on the same year because then, of course, there's, there's no one to teach. And you don't have a country that has all of its fields take off the same year. You do a rotation. Maybe you divide your fields into seven and every year a different batch of those seven groups would take a year off. That makes sense. And therefore you have, you know, six out of seven, you have 85% of all the fields are working every single year. Shemitah is different. The entire year, all the fields on the land lay fallow. It's a very unusual thing. You know, you can imagine what would happen if all the accountants or the lawyers or the shopkeepers all took off a year. Or what would happen if all the physicians took a year off? Wouldn't the country, wouldn't the society face grave problems? And all the more so. You know, what's more basic than food to feed the nation? And the farmers who work on the agriculture, on the farms, they produce the food for everyone and they all take a year off, what's everyone going to eat? And it's also important to look at this in context. You know, today we can import grain from other countries and most people are not farmers. But in antiquity, when people lived in an agrarian society, everyone relied on agriculture and the international trade wasn't as developed. If you don't have food, if you don't have farmers, everyone, everyone essentially dies. So what's this mitzvah that's being demanded of us that everyone takes a year off from agriculture? And perhaps we can suggest, and this is one of the themes that we'll see again and again throughout the parsha, that the law of Shemitah is a, an instruction for us to cease relying on ourselves and rely only on God. There's a verse later on in this chapter that says, God tells us, well, what's going to be? You're going to say, what are you going to eat? And God says, don't worry about it. I got you covered. I'll give you bumper crops. You'll have three years worth of produce of grain in the year six, and I'll cover you for year seven and for year eight. You'll, You'll be good. Still, for a farmer to fulfill this challenging mitzvah, they have to develop fortitude to rely on God. And perhaps we can say that this is really the essence of all the mitzvahs. All the mitzvahs are to foster that connection between us, between the Jewish people and God, and for us to cease relying on ourselves and begin to rely on God, and maybe even to realize that even when we do work in the fields, we do plow and, and sow and till and harvest, even then it's a miracle, even then It's from God. After all, you take an inedible seed and you put it in inedible soil and you water it and you wait. And what do you have? You have a fruit bearing tree. Isn't that a miracle as well? So what what we're being guided here, we're being trained here in the mitzvah of Shemitah is really to rely on God totally and to turn off, so to speak, all those valves that we think give us, you know, the levers of control of our destiny and rely entirely on God. Maybe we can suggest that this is really the essence of all the mitzvahs. If you were to think of one mitzvah that is emblematic of the goal of the entire body of Torah, it's Shemitah. And therefore, yes, there's a need to convey a message regarding all of Torah and what better candidate then the mitzvah of Shemitah to say, oh, this was given at Sinai and all the mitzvahs, which are different examples of this message of reliance on God, they too are derived from this mitzvah. And there's a few interesting Rashis here that I think really hammer home this point. The Sabbath produce of the land shall be yours to eat for you, for your slave and for your maidservant, for your laborers and for the resident who dwell with you. Rashi tells us that the prohibition of us doing work on 
the Shemitah year, it's not in enjoying it, it's not in eating it. Rather, we should not behave as if we are the boss. Rather, everyone's equal. You, your laborers, the people who who live in your neighborhood, everyone's equal. Normally, you know, it's my field. There's no trespassing. Bitch sign. No trespassing. It's mine. I show, I display ownership. What happens on Shemitah? I say, you know what? The sign comes down. Everyone's equal. Really, it belongs to God. There's a famous story about Reb Chaim Velazhener that two litigants came to argue over a property. Each one says, no, this is my property. The other one says, no, that's my property. So the rabbi, he takes the two litigants and they actually travel to the location of the property. And he lays down and puts his ear to the ground and he starts listening. Very bizarre. And then he comes up and tells him, you know, it's really interesting. You, person A, say it belongs to you. You, person B, says it belongs to you. But I'm listening to the property. And it says you guys are being silly because both of you will eventually belong to me, i.e. both of you will eventually die and you'll be interred in the ground. And that's a theme that we see here, that we think we're in control. We think that we're in charge. We have a say. We control our destiny. But ultimately, it's God. And ultimately, we're here for a couple of years. And the hope is that we could accentuate our angelic half before we are all interred in the ground and set to face the Almighty. And I think there's another law here in, in, in this year, the seventh year, that really, again, reinforces this point, And that is the law of Shemitah with respect to money. If I loan someone money, they have to pay me back. But every seven years, the Shemitah cycle annuls those loans. So if I lend my neighbor $100, comes a loan Shemitah, and I can no longer demand repayment. There, there are some workarounds, the, the Prisbal law. But I think this really does show us that we think we're in charge. We think we have this whole balance sheet of, you know, who owes me and it's all mine and I have a, a calculation, figure it all out. But then comes lunch Shemitah and we relinquish our control. Everything's in, in God's control. So that's the law of Shemitah. In verse 8, we read about a very similar law called the law of, of Yovel. And that's the Jubilee year. So Shemitah is every seven years. Every seven cycles of seven, 49 years, the 50th year, the year that follows the seventh Shemitah year in that cycle is called the Yovel year or the Jubilee year. And this is very similar in laws to to Shemitah, but there are some additional laws as well. So we read in verse 8, you shall count for yourself seven cycles of sabbatical years, seven years, seven times, and then you have a total of 49 years. So that just like there's a mitzvah we read last week to count the 49 days of the Omer between the second day of, of Pesach and the law of, and the, and the festival of Shavuot, there's a very similar thing here, seven days, seven weeks, seven years, seven cycles, towards the 50th year, which is the Jubilee year. And this is actually one of the sister mitzvahs to count these years every year. You know which year it is of the 50-year cycle of Yovo. When that year arrives, on the 10th day of the year, which is Yom Kippur, there is a special mitzvah to blow the shofar. And on that blowing of the shofar, it heralds freedom for the land. What happens? The slaves are freed, the ancestral lands are restored, and just as in the Shemitah year, meaning year 7, year 14, year 21, year 49, year 50, the year of the Jubilee, is also a back-to-back Shemitah year. Not only cannot you work on year 49, you cannot work on year 50 either. So there's a few things here to, to unpack. Number one, this idea of the shofar blast. And we know that the shofar is a very powerful tool to inspire action. And the Sefer Chinuch in Mitzvah number 331, he tells us a very interesting idea. He says, you know, if someone has a slave, you kind of, you feel like you own them. And it's very hard for you to release them. And here we're told that every 50 years, you have to relinquish all your slaves. So how do you do that? How do you muster up the courage to forfeit your property, so to speak? What you do is build a shofar. And the shofar, it awakens you. It awakens your heart. And it awakens the heart of your slave as well. 
And when you have this nationwide blowing of the shofar, this, it kind of sets a reset to the whole cycle. Everyone goes back to their home. Everyone goes back to the ancestral lands. All the slaves are freed. And you know what? It may be difficult, but when you blow the shofar and everyone starts releasing their slaves, it'll be easier for you to release yours. Moreover, even if your slave says, you know what? I kind of like it here. He has to also be awakened by that blast of the shofar. It's time for him to press the reset on his life as well. Now, verse 10 is a very interesting verse here. You shall sanctify the 50th year. That's the Yovel year, the Jubilee year. And proclaim freedom throughout the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be the Jubilee year for you. You shall return each man to his ancestral heritage and return each man to his family. This verse is actually inscribed on the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia that, of course, was run to proclaim to herald freedom in, in the United States. And the slaves are freed. Ancestral lands are restored. When the Jewish people got to Israel, they, each family and each tribe was apportioned a section of the land, and each family was given an ancestral plot of land that's theirs. And even if they sell it, they could sell it for a maximum of 50 years because every Yovel cycle it returns to the family or its heirs. Now, there's an interesting Rambam who tells us how this would work because you know, the 50th year starts in Rosh Hashanah. The Jewish yearly cycle starts in Rosh Hashanah. Whereas the shofar blast is only on Yom Kippur, which is 10 days later. So what would happen during the interim stage of those of those 10 days? So the Ram tells us, this is in the laws of Shemitah, chapter 10, law number 14, that from Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the Jubilee year, until Yom Kippur, the 10th day, there was a interim period. The slaves would not be freed, but would still not be working. And the fields would not be restored yet to their ancestral owners, rather. What would the slaves do? They would eat, and they would drink, and they would celebrate, and they'd be joyous, and their crowns would be on their heads. Once Yom Kippur arrives, and they blow the shofar, at that point... The slaves return to their homes and the fields are restored to their owners. An interesting idea that even the freedom kind of happens in stages. They're first released from servitude and they have a a time of joy, of celebration, and then they're actually sent home. Maybe similar to what happened in Egypt. There was that period at the end of the enslavement, the last year when the plagues were happening, the Jewish people had not yet left but they were not no longer still enslaved. Now, the rest of the Parsha is going to talk about things that don't seem to relate directly to the law of Shemitah, but Rashi tells us all the way at the end of the Parsha that there's a, a sequence that's following here. There's a certain progression. You know, the law of Shemitah is very demanding. You have to cease work on your field, and you have to risk, essentially, at least in your eyes, you risk the fact that you might go hungry, your family might starve. And it's very difficult. And you may say that, you know, this is too much for me. I can't handle that. I have to work the field. I got to plow it a little bit, plant it a little bit, just so I have some produce, so I have some grain to feed my family. And the rest of the Parsha describes the consequences of that decision. There's a certain subplot, even though the rest of the Parsha seems to be talking about things that are not related at all to Shemitah. They're all describing scenarios in a sequential, progressive fashion of what happens if you reject, if you reject the law of Shemitah. So the first thing that happens is what happens if someone has to sell items that they own. They sell, have to sell their possessions. So Rashi tells us if you don't observe the Shemitah, you think you'll become rich after it. You'll, you'll think you'll survive. You think it'll help you financially, but you'll need to sell your movable property. And this is kind of the first step. People don't like parting with their stuff. But you know what? If it's movable property, if it's not real estate, it's less painful. If they don't have to sell their home, if they don't have to sell their field, it's not as bad. So this is the first kind of consequence of not obeying the laws of Shemitah is that you'll have to eventually sell your movable possessions. Now, there's an interesting Rashi here. The verse says, when you should make a sale to your fellow, 
or make a purchase from the land of your fellow, do not aggrieve one another. So law is talking about doing business with other Jews, but doing it with, with integrity, not to cheat them, not to try to steal from them, to be honest in our business dealings with others. And Rashi also tells us that what's hinted in the verse is that when you do do business, you should try to find someone of your brethren, a Jewish person to do business with. So if you have two stores, you can buy your hardware in, in store A and store B, one's owned by a Jew, one's owned by a non-Jew. We like to support our own. It's a mitzvah for you to support your Jewish brethren in the event that you have options. Don't deliberately say I'm going to go to the non-Jew just to stick it to my my Jewish friend. In fact, do the opposite. Try to give them the opportunity to the business when it is when it is possible. And then we read in verse 15 that when you want to renegotiate a deal, you negotiate it based upon the sales price. So for example, if someone sells a a, a plot of land that is part of the ancestral heritage of one family, so like we said, it goes till the Ovel, it goes till the Jubilee year. So let's say there's, you know, 40 years left to the Jubilee. It's the 10th year of the cycle. So there's 40 years left. Then in effect, you're not selling the land itself. It's sort of speak like a 40-year lease. And therefore, if you want to buy it back, we know the price per year. You just divide the sales price in 40, and that's the price per year. And therefore, you want to buy it back after 35 years. You have five years left or whatever the year, however many years you have left, that's how much the sales price should be. If you restore it, don't try to cheat your friend. He wants to buy his ancestral homeland. Give it back to him at a fair price. And there's another law here in verse 17. You should not aggrieve your fellows. This in verse 14 it talks about not to aggrieve someone in business. In verse, in verse 17, it's not to aggrieve someone with words. You should fear God. I am Hashem, your God. Don't cheat or torment with words. And Rashi explains, as he's done many times throughout this parsha and the previous one, that whenever it says you should fear God, that's a reference to things that may be, you could harbor internal feelings that no one else could know. You could say, oh, I'm not really cheating because there's no way for someone to prove that you really are. But God, of course, knows what you're thinking. God knows what's happening in your heart. And if you're cheating him in your heart, it's still a violation of this mitzvah. And therefore, you should fear God. He knows what's really happening. Now, there's a very important law here that we see in the Sefer Chinuch, in the uh, elucidation of this mitzvah. Someone cannot, by this Torah law, aggrieve his fellow. But what if that person is the recipient of someone else's torment? So what happens if someone is being bullied? Are they allowed to aggrieve the bully? So typically we would think, no, you have to just turn the other cheek, right? No. There's a law, quotes the Sefer Chinuch. If someone comes to kill you, you kill them first. And that does not only apply in cases of life or death. If someone comes to damage you, to injure you, you don't need to be a sitting duck. You don't need to be like sheep to the slaughter. You could defend yourself and you ought to defend yourself. And of course, this applies with children as well. I tell my children, if, if someone's hitting you, you hit them back twice as hard. You have to defend yourself. That too is a Torah ideal. Don't be a victim. Don't be someone who just sits and, and bears the blow. You have to defend yourself. And that applies not only physically, but also emotionally. If someone's attacking you, you have to defend yourself. That's appropriate. Don't let our children, certainly, but we don't let other Jews suffer needlessly. This law, not to aggrieve your fellow, means don't to, don't to do it, don't, don't do it unnecessarily. But if that's your way of defending yourself, then that would be okay. A little bit of counterintuitive idea, but it makes sense. You shall perform my command, my decrees and observe my ordinances and perform them. Then you shall dwell securely on the land. So Rashi here tells us another interesting idea. In the middle of these verses, we have a pledge from God. If, if we perform his decrees, if we observe his ordinances, then we'll dwell securely in the land. And Rashi explains that this refers back to the laws of Shemitah. If we obey the laws of Shemitah, then we'll have stability in the land. Whereas if we reject it, he's going to kick us out. So similarly to the idea that we saw earlier, that Shemitah is all about us relinquishing our claim 
on the land and acknowledging that really it's all God's. And therefore, if we obey the law of Shemitah, then God says, okay, you could stay. What happens when we say, you know, we're in charge. God says, oh, you're in charge? Really? Let's see how in charge you really are. And we will get bounced out. And Rashi, again, this is a continuation of that progression that we spoke about, that when we disobey the law of Shemitah, we'll have to sell our stuff. And we'll also, as a result of that, we will suffer the pain and the anguish of of exile. And there's a very interesting continuation here that we see in verse 19 through 22. The land will give its fruit, and you will eat its fill. You will dwell securely upon it. Verse 20. If you will say, what will we eat in the seventh year? Behold, we won't sow, we won't gather. Says God, I will ordain my blessing for you in the sixth year. It will yield a crop sufficient for a three-year period. You will sow in the eighth year, but you will eat from the old crop till the ninth year, until the arrival of its crop, you will eat the old. God is promising us here a bountiful yield in the sixth year's crop to cover us for year six, year seven, and year eight until the time has arrived for us to have the new crop of of year eight. This idea is presented as a psychological proof to Torah. You know, if the Torah was of human authorship, would this law, would it ever appear and could a human make a promise? Oh, take a whole the whole nation, take a whole year off of agriculture. Oh, what, what what's going to be? You're going to starve to death? Nah, don't worry, I got you covered. Obviously, a human who would be interested in the continuity of the people that they're trying to control would never make that instruction. So, this is an interesting psychological proof that if the Torah, God forbid, if we considered that it was a hoax. And the human, so to speak, authors wanted a myth to be perpetuated. This law and this pledge would torpedo his plans. And by the way, the fact that God promises that there will be a blessing in the crop, that's actually been observed in modern times. Like we said, the law of Shemitah is still observed in many farms in Israel. And there's been many documented miracles that happened in these societies, in these farms who observed the Shemitah. So, for example, in 1952, there was a miracle that they, uh, the Shemitah observant farmers delayed planting based upon Shemitah considerations. And they planted way late in the cycle. And that year, the rain was delayed. And therefore, all the farmers that had planted in opposition to the laws of Shemitah, lost their their yield, but the ones who obeyed the Shemitah, they had an eighth year bumper crop. Another miracle happened in 1959. There was a locust swarm that stopped at the doors of the Moshav Komimiyot, which was the first the first settlement in Israel that was exclusively inhabited by Shemitah observant farmers. Okay, so the next law that we see is the idea of redemption of the land. So we already saw that the land returns to its original owner at the Yovo. But what if the owner wants to buy it back? So that's the laws that we see over here. How, under what circumstances, under what parameters can the owner redeem the land? Now, again, as we mentioned earlier, there's a certain progression here. Someone doesn't obey the Shemitah, they'll eventually be compelled to sell their movable assets. And here, we're describing someone selling their their ancestral land, which is the next stage of degradation that results from disobeying of the, of the Shemitah year. So if someone wants to rebuy back their ancestral heritage, it can only be redeemed after two years. So I sell, let's say, in the 10th year of the Yovo cycle, I sell my ancestral homeland. I cannot buy it back before two years have passed. So only two years, i.e. the 12th year of the of the Yovo cycle, 12th of the Jubilee cycle, only then can I buy it back. And the way the value is calculated is the per annum value of the field. So divide the amount of the sales price by the amount of years left until the Yovel, until the Jubilee, and then reduce how many years I've 
already sold it for and then calculate what is left. And that the, the, the new owner has to relinquish it to the family if they want to buy it back. The next law is if someone sells their home in a walled city. So again, this is the next level of progression. If you don't keep the Shemitah, you'll sell your movable assets, you'll sell your ancestral fields, and then your ancestral homeland. What are the parameters of redeeming a home in a walled city versus an unwalled city? So we read, if a man shall sell a resident in a walled city, this is verse 29, its redemption can take place until the end of the year of its sale. Its period of redemption shall be a year. So here we see that a home in a walled city does not return by the Jubilee, and it can only be redeemed before a year, up to a year. Whereas in verse 31, we see about a houses in open towns, i.e. in unwalled cities, which have no surrounding wall, shall be considered like the land's open field. It shall have a redemption and shall go out in the Jubilee year. So there's a very interesting distinction here between someone selling a home in a walled city versus a home in an unwalled city. If it's unwalled, then it could be redeemed, just like the field, and it returns to its original owner at the Yovel. Whereas if it's a home in a walled city, then it can only be redeemed before a year and it does not return at the 50th year, at the Jubilee year. So what could possibly be the difference between homes in a walled city versus homes in an unwalled city? So that's an interesting question. And there's various answers given, like the Rabban gives an answer. But a very interesting answer I see here in the Mesha Chachma. He explains if you have a walled city, why would there be a wall around the city? It's most likely a border town, a town that secures the heartland, the people in the walled city, they have to be accustomed to living there. And what happens if every 50 years, the whole town is inhabited by newcomers? They don't know each other. They don't know their way around. They don't know the ins and outs of defending against an invasion. And then the heartland will be vulnerable. And therefore, if you sell your home in a walled city, that's a permanent sale. You only have up to one year to buy it back. Because otherwise, it is permanently in the hands of the person who buys it from you. And then we read about the status of the Levite cities and fields. They are always redeemable, never becomes permanently in the hands of the buyer, and it can be redeemable right away. And then we see in verse 35, a mitzvah to prevent poverty before it's too late. If your brother becomes impoverished and his means fall to your proximity, you shall strengthen him. A proselyte or a resident, this law applies not only to Jews, but to non-Jews as well, provided that they are obeying the seven Noahide laws, so that he can live with you. Don't charge him interest if you give him a loan. Don't give your food for increase. I am Hashem, your God. I'll take you to the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan to be a God unto you. So this is an interesting law here, that not only do we help the poor with charity, but we also help the people who are struggling and we support them before they become poor. And Rashi gives us an example. If you have a, you have a donkey, it's, it's struggling with its load. You have one person could kind of support it and could stabilize it. Whereas if the donkey collapsed under the burden of its yoke, of its load, of its cargo, then you'll need a minimum of five people to, to, to make it stand up again and to, to, and to stabilize it. Similarly, if someone is struggling with a little jolt of support, they can be stabilized. Whereas if someone totally collapsed, then it's a much greater effort to to restore them to stability. And therefore, we're told to support them. And if that means giving them a loan, we cannot charge interest. And even though Rashi explains, even though interest makes sense, you know, if I'm giving away my money to someone, I should get something in return. And therefore, the Torah tells us, no, 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 I am Hashem your God, like we, like Rashi explains. Every time it says, I am Hashem your God, it's a warning, don't do it, even though you think you should do it, or it's okay to do it. Don't charge interest. Now, there's an interesting distinction here. Even though we have to support the non-Jew, we are not mandated to give an interest-free loan to a non-Jew. In fact, we could, we should charge, in, charge interest. The difference is, is that if, if you have a Jewish brethren of yours, and they need help, we don't charge interest 
to our brothers. Yes, interest makes sense. Interest makes sense. It doesn't, it's illogical for me to, to, to put my money in a place where it's not yielding anything. It's not getting any return. But if it's your brother, you don't charge interest. And our sages tell us, if someone does charge interest when they loan to a Jew, then when people are resuscitated, the resurrection of the dead, those people will not come back to life. There's a famous story about Rabbi Akiva Eger, one of the sages of the end of the 18th and the early 19th century. He was the rabbi of a city called Posen, and there was a Jewish man who loaned money with interest. And when he died, the burial society, the Hever Kadisha, they charged an exorbitant price for the burial. And the man's family complained to the authorities. It's not fair. How come, you know, every person who dies, they get a, a certain price, whereas our father died and the Hever Kadisha, the burial society, wants to get back in it for loaning with interest and therefore they charge a lot more. So they came to the rabbi for an explanation. And the rabbi explained that if someone lands with interest, you won't be revived when God revives the dead. And therefore, explains Rabbi Kiva Eger, that an average Jew is buried, well, how long are they going to be using that plot of land? It's temporary. They're like renting the burial plot. Whereas if someone is not going to be revived, well, then it's permanent. And therefore, when someone... Is buried, a regular Jew is buried. It's 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 only a temporary. Therefore, it's cheap. It's like a rent. It's like a rental. Whereas someone lends with interest, they're buying their burial plot permanently because you won't rise when everyone else rises, and therefore you should be charged a higher rate. So this is the idea not to charge interest when we loan our fellow Jews. And Rashi also adds that there are several ways to try to avoid this with loopholes don't do that either unless there's a legitimate way to do it don't try to do it in an illegitimate way don't say oh this money is not really mine it belongs to a non-jew and therefore i can charge with interest don't try to find creative ways around this understand the principle the principle is this is your brother and brothers help each other and again rashi tells us that this is a continuation of the progression the subplot of the whole chapter if you don't keep laws of Shemitah, eventually you'll have to borrow money with interest. And the meaning behind these laws, we read in verse 38, I'm Hashem your God, I took the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan to be a God unto you. The reason why I took you out of Egypt, to give you those mitzvahs and even the ones that are difficult. These are the conditions of our release. We were in shackles in Egypt and God took us out on condition we obey the laws, even the laws that are very difficult. And these are done in the land of Israel. And in Israel, God is a God over us. And Rashi tells us an idea that we've seen it actually previously in the end of Parshas Achare, that if someone lives in Israel, they have a much deeper, more intimate connection with God. Whereas if someone leaves Israel, Rashi says that it's as if they're idolaters, it's as if they're severing their connection with God meaning that this high stature, this relationship, this priorities that we're developing in this parsha, the idea that we're living on a higher plane, we're relying on God and we're behaving in this in this very elevated way, that's manifested in our living in the land of Israel. So all these laws, we lend without interest, we annul the loans on the Shemitah, we free the slaves, we return rightfully purchased property. We seize work every seventh year on our fields. All those laws are because of a close relationship, and that close relationship is especially present in the land of Israel. In fact, even today, the relationship that we have with God is felt most in the land of Israel. My grandfather used to love telling over the story of what happened in the Gulf War of 1990-1991. In January and February of 1991, Iraq was shooting Scud missiles both at American positions in Arabia, but also at at Israel, even though Israel was not involved in that conflict. And in fact, one of them, one of these Scud missiles, struck an American barracks in Riyadh and killed 27 soldiers. Whereas 39 missiles fell in the land of Israel, and there was only one 
casualty, one direct casualty from those missiles. And the person who died, someone who lived in Tel Aviv, but he was someone who would deliberately annoy people by driving his motorcycle throughout the religious neighborhoods on Shabbat. And my grandfather used to talk about this, the fact that it's almost like, you know, even before the Iron Dome, there was like a, a heavenly Iron Dome that directed these massive missiles that would create huge destruction if it would hit heavily populated locations. They all fell in fields. They fell in places where no one was injured, no one was killed. And the only person that died was someone who was just a, a, a very kind of terrible character, someone who would go out of his way to disobey the will of, of God. So this is an interesting concept that we see here, that God took us out of the land of Egypt to give us land of Canaan and to be a God for us, and that is manifested most in, in Israel. Now, the next law is what happens when a Jewish brother of yours becomes impoverished and is sold as a slave. So you have a Jewish slave. And of course, this is the next progression. If someone disobeys God and works on his field on Shemitah, eventually he'll be sold as a slave to a Jewish owner. So what are the laws of having a Jewish slave? You shall not work with him with slave labor. Don't degrade him. Don't embarrass him. Don't force him to do demeaning work that injures his pride, that wounds his sense of, of self. So I should explain, like, don't force him to carry your clothing. Don't force him to tie your shoes. Don't degrade him. Don't treat him in a demeaning fashion. Like a laborer or a resident, he shall be with you until the jubilee year. He shall work with you. And then he shall leave, he and his children with them. He shall return him to his family and to his ancestral heritage shall he return. So there's a few things here we see. Number one, that when he leaves, he and his children leave with him. Now, why would his children leave with him? And Rashi explains, according from the Talmud, that when you buy a Jewish slave, so of course it's, it's only a temporary ownership, but it actually comes with responsibilities. And part of those responsibilities are not only feeding your slave, but feeding his family too. And therefore, when he leaves, when your slave leaves, his children go with him because they were really with you. They, they were your responsibility when he was working for you. In addition, when he is restored, so you read in verse 41, he should return to his family and to his ancestral heritage. Not only he's returned to his family, he's returned to his Dignity. If he had a stature they had previously, he returns that as well. He gets a clean slate like, like everyone else does on the Jubilee year. Don't treat him as a former slave. He is given a fresh, clean slate. Start from scratch. Restore his dignity. He lost nothing over those years. Why? So we read in verse 42, For they are my servants whom I have taken out of the land of Egypt. Don't think they're your servants. They're really mine. I have priority, my ownership, so to speak, of them, says God, supersedes yours. And therefore, when you treat them as a slave, treat them in a manner that's befitting someone who is a child of God, someone who is a Jew. When you sell them, if you have to sell them, don't sell them in the manner of slaves. Treat them with dignity, treat them with respect. And don't subject them to hard labor. Don't force them to do needless work. Don't deliberately torment them and make them do things that you don't need. As an example of this, there's a famous episode with Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, and he was washing his hands, mitzvah to wash your hands under certain circumstances, you go to the bathroom, you have to eat bread, etc. And he was washing his hands very sparingly, using the water very little. And someone asked him, well, why don't you use more water? Why don't you use the water more liberally? And he says, well, who has to collect this water? It comes from the well, someone has to schlep it. Your mitzvah does not mean someone else should be forced to have to schlep more water. That's an example of, of, of being so sensitive. Yes, we're paying them. Yes, if we have a Jewish slave, we so to speak own them. But don't force them to do things that are unnecessary. Even if you see some benefit, try to make their life easier. And then in verse 47, read about the ultimate degradation if a Jewish brother of ours is sold not as a slave to a Jew, but as a slave to a non-Jew. And of course, in that instance, we try whatever we can to get them out of that predicament. That said, even though they could be redeemed right away, 
and we should try and do everything we can to prevent him from falling so low, from losing their identity as a Jew, from being around people who who don't value the same priorities that we value. Nevertheless, if we redeem them, we have to pay fair market value for them. And Rashi explains, even if we have the power, we're in charge. It's our land. We don't cheat the Gentile. Why? Because if we do that, it desecrates God's name. And in fact, our sages tell us that not only are we not allowed to steal from a non-Jew, stealing from a non-Jew is more severe than stealing from a Jew. Because there's two sins. A, the sin of stealing, and B, the sin of desecration of God's name. These non-Jews say, hey, look at these Jews. They say they're God's people. Look how they behave in this amoral fashion. And I think it's it's important to note here, can we think of anything more important than to rescue a Jew who's being treated as a slave by a non-Jew? The objective is something of such importance. Nevertheless, we have to act with integrity around uh, everyone, but certainly around non-Jews. There's a story with uh, my great uncle, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, who's one of the great uh, leaders of American Jewry in in the 20th century, but he originally was from Europe and he was a rabbi in Europe. And it was an amazing story. We know that Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky was someone who was very fastidious about being honest in every way. And there was a story, uh, one of the people, one of his constituents in his town in Europe, they went to the bank and they had to pay something. It was a bank or a postal service. And the clerk paid him a little too much. And his question to the rabbi was, must I go back and return the money to to the clerk? So the rabbi tells him, I think it's it's appropriate for you to do that. After all, you know, if you unilaterally volunteer to return the money, you were you were under charge. They gave you too much change, whatever it may be. It's proper for you to go. It'll be a kiddush Hashem. It'll be a sanctification of God's name. They'll say, "Hey, look at these Jews. They're very moral." So he went and returned the money to the to the bank, to the postal service, to the clerk. Sometime later, the rabbi himself had to go to the post office. He had to buy some some stamps. And he buys the stamps and the clerk gives him a lot of stamps. And it seems like it's a lot more than he paid for it. And he starts walking out and he sees the clerk snickering behind him. So right away he says, you know what, I'm going to count these stamps to see if I got more than I was entitled to. And he counts them and he realizes that he, he he was given too many stamps for what he paid. And he understood that the clerk was testing him to see, are all Jews being honest or was it that one Jew? The rabbi comes in, what's what's he going to do? Right away he turns around and he returns what was what was extra, what he didn't pay for. Many years later, Rabbi Kamenetsky moved to America in 1935. Many years later, after the Holocaust, after World War II, the rabbi found out that in that town – there were only a few righteous Gentiles that hid Jews in their home. And one of them was that very same clerk from the post office. And the rabbi declared, I think I could say with certainty that the reason why he had this respect for human life, for the Jews, is because he saw that they were honest, they acted with integrity. So here's this idea that even though you know, we could say, hey, you know, we have police power, we're in charge. We could discriminate against the non-Jews. We could, and who's going to stop us? Still, is a mitzvah for us not to steal. We have to act with, with integrity, with honesty, even if we're trying to save someone from the terrible fate of being a slave to a non-Jew. We still cannot cheat them. We have to pay them fair market price if we want to buy them back. We don't want to be the ones, God forbid, who cause a desecration of, of God's name. In the event that the Jewish slave was not redeemed, then he too shall go out in the Jubilee year, him and his children with him. Rashi again tells us that that means that even if a non-Jewish owner owns the slave, he is obligated not only in taking care of the well-being of his Jewish slave, but of that slave's family as well. For the children of Israel are servants to me. They are my servants whom I've taken out of the land of Egypt. I am Hashem, your God. This is a clear elucidation here in verse 55 
of the relationship the Jewish people have with God. They are servants to me. They're my servants. I take them out of the land of Egypt. I am Hashem, your God. You know, the entire parasha is a reflection of this idea that we are totally committed to God. We're his servants. He took us out to create that special heightened relationship, this new individual, this new Jew, so to speak, that is given all these laws. And, you know, if we didn't have Torah, many of these laws, maybe all of them, we wouldn't, we wouldn't obey. Why do we obey them? Because of this verse, God took us out. He wants to create a special relationship with him. We're his servants. He took us out of the land of Egypt to create that special relationship with us. We're living on that heightened, elevated plane. The final two verses of the Parsha, you shall not make idols for yourself. You shall not erect for yourself a statue, a pillar, and your land shall not in place a flooring stone upon which to prostrate yourself, for I am Hashem, your God. What is the connection between the last concept, the last law, the last topic of chapter 25 and this one in chapter 26? Rashi explains what this is telling us. This is still a reference to someone who was sold as a slave to the non-Jew That person should not say, hey, after all, my boss, my owner, he's acting in the immoral fashion. He's engaging in promiscuity. He's engaging in idolatry. He's desecrating the Shabbos. I should behave like that. Therefore, the Torah tells us, don't make an idol for yourself. My Sabbath you shall observe. My sanctuary you shall you revere. I am Hashem. Even someone who has fallen to the lowest stature possible, they've lost everything and they're not, they're a slave and they're not even owned by a Jew, they're owned by a non-Jew. Even that person is given some guidance how to behave in, in that scenario. And I think the lesson for us is, you know, we can say, hey, what difference does it make if I observe this mitzvah? After all, I'm not religious. Or after all, I have so many other problems. I have so many other sins. Let's just lump it all in together. You can't do that. Why? Because even someone who has re- reached the absolute nadir of the human experience, even he is is given guidance of how to behave in that situation, in that scenario. Parsha's Bechukosai, the last parsha in the book of Leviticus, has 78 verses and 12 mitzvahs, and it's only two chapters. And it's uh, very different chapters. The first chapter is one of the two places in the Torah where we have admonition we have rebuke and the way it's structured is is very simple very clear if then if you obey the torah if you obey the mitzvahs if you follow god fantastic things will happen to you you'll be blessed you'll have prosperity everything will be fantastic however in the unfortunate event where you choose to disobey the will of god where you choose to abandon torah then a series of Terrible, terrible things will happen to you, and it describes in in gruesome and gory and macabre detail all the terrible things that will happen to us. This appears in uh, our chapter, chapter 26 of Leviticus, and one more time, a more expanded version of this same theme is told to us in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 28. And the second chapter of the Parsha, which is chapter 27, the final part, the final chapter in the book of Leviticus details certain laws related to offerings, donations to the temple, seemingly a very different theme from the first half of the parsha to the second half of the parsha. Now, before we begin to study the parsha and the blessings of the curses, it is interesting to note that the curses, the consequences of disobeying God, are much more comprehensive than the blessings if we do obey the will of God. And perhaps we could say that, you know, the objective of these blessings and curses are both the same. They're not there to intimidate us. They're not there to frighten us. They're there to inspire us. They're there to show us what we really have to choose when we choose one option or the other. And therefore, the question is, which one of those two is more motivational? And today, we know via science that people are more motivated to protect what they have, to not lose the fair of of loss, of what you could potentially lose, is much more motivating than what you could potentially gain. And therefore, the Torah structures it in a way that it gives us 10 verses of blessings followed by 45 curses that gets sequentially worse and worse as we continue to disobey the will of God. So the Parsha begins, If you will follow my decrees and observe my commandments and perform them, then I will provide you rain in their time, and the land will give its produce, and the trees of the field will give its fruit. 
Your threshing will last until the vintage. The vintage will last until the sowing. You will eat your bread to, to satiation. You will dwell securely in the land. If you obey the decrees, fantastic things will happen to you. Now, Rashi points out a very famous comment here that if you read the very first verse, if you follow my decrees and observe my commandments. So what's the difference between following God's decrees and obeying, observing his commandments? If it's talking about commandments, well, then it's already covered if you observe my commandments. So what is meant by the beginning of the parasha, if you will follow my decrees, in b'chukosai telechum? So Rashi tells us that this refers not to obeying the mitzvos, but for toiling in Torah. Thus, when the parish begins, if you follow my decrees and observe my commandments, the decrees are toiling in study of Torah, and the commandments refer to the commandments them- themselves. And also on the flip side, in, in verse 14, where it starts talking about the curses, if you disobey my decrees, if you disobey my commandments, again, Rashi tells us that it refers to both the mitzvos and to toiling in Torah. Now, it's interesting that Rashi presents toiling in Torah as the key to unlocking all these tremendous blessings. And there's been tremendous amount of commentary in this line in Rashi. I want to maybe suggest an understanding as to why toiling in Torah is the key here to get these blessings. Perhaps we can suggest a approach based upon a teaching in the Rambam. The Rambam is dealing with a problem. The problem is that the Torah tells us that we have to love God. The problem is that we have a hard time even understanding what God is. It's a concept that's beyond human understanding to fully understand what it means God. And therefore, if we have a hard time understanding God, how can we possibly try to love him? And the Ramadan gives an answer. He says that the Almighty's Torah is the proxy through which we can connect to him. Just like the Almighty is infinite, so too the Torah is infinite. But the difference is that accessing the Torah is feasible, whereas accessing God directly, it's a little bit more difficult. And therefore, the way that we connect to God, the way that we love God is via his Torah and specifically via tapping into the Torah's infinity, so to speak, the fact that it's infinite. Like we've said before, that the Torah is compared to water. If you walk into the Pacific Ocean, you're like, hey, I can walk to Japan. But as you go deeper and deeper into the ocean, you realize how deep it really is. Similarly, with Torah, the more you study it, the more you immerse yourself into it, the more you plumb its depths, the more you realize how deep it really is. And therefore, specifically with toiling in Torah, not just understanding Torah on a superficial, rudimentary level, but trying to go as deep as you can, that is the way that you connect to God. And that connection is what spurs all these tremendous blessings. Deep learning is a segue to developing a relationship with God. And we have a reward. The reward is if we connect to God, if we do his commandments and we study his Torah in a deep way, he'll give us rain in their time. Rashi tells us that what does it mean in their time? In a time that's not harmful. You know, when it, when it's raining, it's great for the fields, but it makes the roads muddy and it causes other hassles. But if it rains overnight when everyone's sleeping anyhow, well, then it's Great rain, but it's also in its time. In addition, Rashi tells us that this is also a supernatural blessing that even non-fruit trees will bear fruit. And we'll have security. I will provide peace in the land. You will lie down and none will frighten you. I will cause wild beasts to withdraw from the land and a sword will not cross your land. And Rashi tells us here a few things. First of all, that not only will we have bread to satiation, but even a small amount of of bread will go a long way. That the spiritual component of food, the fact that food provides satiation, will, will kick in, and with a little bit of food, we'll have a lot of satiation. Moreover, we'll have peace, and if you read the verses critically, you'll notice there's two different kinds of peace. You'll dwell securely in your land, and that's verse 5. And verse 6, I'll provide peace in the land. And Rashi tells us that peace is everything. If you, have, if you don't have peace, you have nothing. And the two kinds of peace, the commentaries explained, is that there's there's different kinds of peace. There's one peace where you don't have foreign enemies, foreign adversaries that are infiltrating your land. And a second peace is internally, within the land itself, there will be harmony, there will be unity, there will be love and kinship amongst your fellow compatriots. And then we read that when we do have enemies, we'll destroy them. You will pursue your enemies 
they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will pursue a hundred, and a hundred of you will pursue ten thousand. If you have only five Jewish soldiers, you'll be able to swamp a hundred enemies. If you have a hundred Jewish soldiers, you'll pursue ten thousand. Rashi tells us that the Torah has an exponential impact. Five people studying Torah is able to overcome a hundred enemies. A hundred people studying Torah, it has a much bigger impact. I will turn my attention to you. I will make you fruitful and increase you. And I will establish my covenant with you. You'll stand erect. You'll stand proud. You'll have gravitas. You'll have stature. You'll have pride. Things will be wonderful. You will eat very old grain and remove the old uh, to make way for the new. Your storehouses will be full. Your granaries will be full. Your fruits won't deteriorate. I will place my sanctuary amongst you. You'll have the presence of God amongst you. So you'll have really everything. You'll have a flourishing physical economic existence. You'll have a flourishing spiritual existence. My spirit won't reject you, God promises. I will walk among you. I will be a God unto you and you will be a people unto me. I am a shepherd God unto you, God of the land of Egypt. From being their slaves, I brought the staves of your yoke and I led you erect. God promises he won't expel us. He won't expunge us. He won't get rid of us. The Ramban here in verse 11 gives us a very interesting Kabbalistic idea by saying that the Jewish people are consumed by holiness. We're consumed by God. We're almost we're like, like we're enveloped by God and therefore we won't be expelled from that holiness. God's going to walk amongst us. Rashi says that this refers to us having strolls with God in paradise we won't be shaking up. We won't be trembling before him. We'll still have reverence for him, but we won't be paranoid spiritually. We'll have a seriousness with our relationship with God. We'll be close to him. He'll be close to us, and things will be wonderful. So this is the beginning of the parasha. And if this is all you read, it sounds like an absolute uh, delight of a reading. If we obey the will of God, we study his Torah, we toil in his Torah, all manners of blessings will befall us. Now, it is interesting that if you look at the blessings in general, it describes, you know, rain in their time and we'll be able to overcome our enemies. It describes a very good life, but it doesn't describe absolute abundant wealth. It doesn't describe, you know, being over the top wealthy. It things will be good. You'll have rain in the time. You'll, you'll have prosperity. You'll have food. You'll have your needs covered, but it doesn't describe tremendous wealth, tremendous riches. And the Rambam explains that there's a difference between facilitatory and ultimate reward. What the Torah is describing here is not the ultimate reward for us obeying the mitzvos and toiling in Torah. Of course, that is, the venue for that is in Olam Abba. We believe that after you die, you go to the world of souls, eventually you end up in the next world, and that's the world in which reward and punishment, ultimate reward and punishment are meted out. In this world, we don't have reward for mitzvos. And to a certain extent, we don't have punishment for sins. And therefore, when it's describing here that things will be good for us here, we'll have rain, we'll have prosperity, we'll have security, we'll have hegemony, that is not reward for our mitzvos. Instead, says the Rambam, that is God saying, if you commit to do the will of God, I will facilitate that. I will enable that. I'll make sure that you don't have any hunger and any any other existential threats, you'll be taken care of so you can focus on your spiritual agenda. Now, the Ramban here in verse 12 asks a different question. How come the Torah does not mention the ultimate reward that we get in Olam Abba? After all, isn't that the bargain? You do mitzvos, you study Torah, you toil in Torah, and the Almighty says, okay, I'll give you a reward in Olam Abba. And in fact, throughout the whole Torah, the concept of the afterlife, the concept of post-mortem reward and punishment is only hinted at overtly. It's never mentioned explicitly. Maybe it should have said over here, if you do the mitzvot, you bait, you bait God, you follow his statutes, you walk in his decrees, then after you die and after your soul goes to heaven, it will be rewarded in a fantastic way. Why is there no mention for Omaba? So Rabban gives two answers. First one is a very powerful idea. He says, It's not necessary to even say that. Everyone knows that. He explains that when the Torah talks about sinners who get their souls cut off, 
You can imply from that that non-sinners don't get their souls cut off and therefore their souls do live on for eternity. Ergo, it's so simple to know that we have eternal life in Olam Abba. After we die, the Torah doesn't even need to mention it. That's his first answer. His second answer is that – this is more of a Kabbalistic idea – that if you read the first 10 verses of our parsha, you should know that it's really talking about Olam Abba. It's describing rain, it's describing satiation, it's describing overcoming your enemies. But if you read it properly and you know the secrets and you know how to read it in a Kabbalistic manner, it's really referring to paradise and Olam Abba. So I guess we have to study the Kabbalistic interpretations to really understand what he's referring to. But the Ramban actually says in a second answer that really if you read the blessings, it is indeed referring to Olam Abba. Okay, so those are the blessings that the Parsha begins with. And then verse 14, but if you will not listen to me and will not perform all of these commandments, if you consider my decrees loathsome, and if you reject my ordinances, you don't perform my commandments, you annul my covenant, then I will do the same to you. And it starts to describe a series of terrible consequences that happened to Jewish people in the event that they disobeyed God, they repudiated his Torah, and they distanced themselves from him. I will assign upon you panic, swelling lesions, burning fever, which will cause your eyes to long and your souls to suffer. You will sow your seeds in vain, for your enemies will eat them. I will turn my attention to you. I'll focus on you. You'll be struck down before your enemies, and those who hate you will will subjugate you, and you will flee with no one pursuing you. So this is just the the very beginning here. I think before we get into the specifics, it's important to understand that these curses – this rebuke, this admonition, there's an objective to it. It's not just punishment. The objective is course correction. You know, we go off the rails. We go off course. The Almighty says, okay, I'm going to nudge you back onto the correct path. The Talmud tells us, the book of Brachos, page 5a, if someone sees that they're suffering, then they should examine their deeds. If you're suffering in one area, examine your deeds. See if there's something that you're doing or something that you're not doing that is the cause for you to get the suffering. And what we can learn from that is that the Almighty employs suffering as a means to nudge us back to the correct path. And there's another point here. Rashi tells us in verse 14, if you read the, if you read the verse, it says, but if you will not listen to me, and will not perform all of these commandments, Rashi tells us that we have to perform all the commandments. And I think that the insight here is that the mitzvos, they're really a package deal. Of course, for some people who don't have a background in in Jewish learning and Jewish observance, the notion of doing all the mitzvos at once is very difficult. But the theory behind it is that we believe the Torah is divine. The Torah comes from the Almighty. And the second you believe that one thing, the Torah is divine, and of course we have abundant evidence to that effect, the second you believe the Torah is divine, then how could you reject any part of it? It means once you believe that one insight, if the Torah is divine, well, then everything in it is divine. The second you say, you know what, this mitzvah really resonates, I'm going to do this one. The other one, mm, not so much. That, even though you're saying you're rejecting only one mitzvah, you may think so, the truth is, you're rejecting the whole thing because that attitude is only possible if someone believes the Torah is not divine. If the Torah is not divine, well, then you say which ones are modern, which ones resonate with our society, which ones are not too difficult for me, and those you'll obey. And therefore, it's better for someone to say, listen, the Torah is all divine, and I have to really do all the mitzvahs, and right now, it's very difficult for me. I'm going to be a sinner. It's better to be a sinner than to be someone who rejects the entirety of Torah wholesale by saying this one is not real, this one's not legit, and therefore I'm not a sinner. Because by doing that, you're really a sinner in all arenas because you're rejecting the entirety of Torah. Now, Rashi develops a theme here that there's seven sins in this admonition. Each one of them leads to the next one, and therefore all the consequences of those seven sins are also seven punishments. So Rashi tells us the first sin is when someone doesn't get dedicate themselves to Torah study. Eventually that leads to them not performing mitzvos. Eventually they become disgusted and revolted by people who are loyal to Torah. 
They hate the sages that teach the mitzvos. They start preventing others from performing the mitzvos. Then they begin to deny the divinity of the commandments and eventually they deny the existence of God. These are the seven sins that are described here at the beginning of the admonition. And as a result of those seven sins, there are seven consequences. And again, not punishments, but ways of God getting our attention and hopefully encouraging us to rectify our ways. Now, I think it's important to acknowledge that if we have a certain grasp on Jewish history, we'll find a lot of these descriptions of the terrible events described in the Torah, we'll find them to be spine-chillingly accurate because these are events that have happened to our nation. There's a very long Ramban here who elaborates how the admonition, the rebuke over here, that refers to the events that coincided with the destruction of the first temple. And the one in Deuteronomy, the, the description of the terrible things that befell to the Jewish people in chapter 20 of Deuteronomy, that actually played out in the era of the destruction of the second temple. So here we have the first series of seven punishments, swelling lesions, burning fever, frustrated longing. We're going to sow seeds that will produce crops for the enemies. Rashi brings two interpretations. Is that is that with respect to produce or is that with respect to children? We're going to be struck down by the enemy. We're going to be subjugated by the enemy and we're going to flee with no one in pursuit. And it's interesting that this is a worse curse to be running away from a non-existent threat, that's worse than running away from a pursuer. And the Gona Vilna used to say, quoting a verse in Ecclesiastes, that the Almighty defends someone who is fleeing from a pursuer. Even if the pursuer is righteous, the Almighty will defend the victim. And therefore, when it tells us over here that we're going to be fleeing, but there really isn't a pursuer, that's going to tell us that we're not going to have the protection of God. He's not going to defend us because there is, after all, no pursuer. Well, if all these terrible things happen to us, then we don't listen. Verse 18, if despite this, you don't heed me, then I shall punish you further. Seven ways for your sin. The temples will be destroyed. The heaven will be like iron, no rain. The earth will be like copper, no produce. You will extend your strength in vain. The earth will not yield crops. The trees will not yield fruit. And even the fruit that it does yield will drop off the tree before maturity. And in verse 20, we read again the, the agony of this punishment. Your strength will be spent in vain. Your land will not give its produce. You're going to work hard in the land. Rashi tells us, you know, you have someone... Who doesn't plow, doesn't sow, doesn't weed, doesn't clear away the thorns, doesn't hoe? And then what happens? When it's time for the harvest, a blight comes and destroys all the crops. But after all, he didn't work on the crops, so it doesn't, it's not so painful. But what happens when someone does plow and does sow and does weed and every day is sweating and toiling on the field, clearing away the, thor- the thorns, hoeing yet? And after, when it's time to finally reap the harvest, a blight comes and, des- and destroys it. There's no more pain than that. The agony of, of futility is just miserable. And that's what God's promising. If we don't return to him, that's what he's going to do to us. And then we have the third series, verse 21. If you behave casually with me, you refuse to heed me. You don't take the lesson home. I shall lay a further blow upon you seven ways like your sin. Again, if we treat God with casualness, with randomness, we don't take the lesson to heart. We have apathy. We have complacency. Rashi adds that we do mitzvot sometimes when when it's convenient for us. We don't take the lesson home. There's a famous uh, Rambam in the beginning of the Laws of Fast Days where he tells us that when bad things happen to us, it's a mitzvah from the Torah to pull out the trumpets and to scream out and to make announcements for this suffering to recognize what happened to us and to try to rectify the ways. And this, these are the ways of repentance, he tells us, when bad things happen to us, to cry out, to weep, because we recognize that it is our actions, our bad actions, that caused that to happen to us. And the hope is that when we recognize that 
bad things happen to us because of our relationship with God and we rectify our ways, then the symptom of that problem will go away too. But if we don't listen, we are promised here in Leviticus 26 a third series of consequences. Wild beasts will reign upon us. Even domestic animals will die. We'll have to deal with venomous snakes. Uh, God forbid the children will die. The livestock will die. The population will shrink. The roads will be desolate. If despite this, we don't listen, again, we're going to have seven ways, seven consequences for our sin. The sword of the foreign invaders will happen. We'll have siege. The people will be forced into the cities. There'll be plagues. There'll be food shortages, lack of fuel. We'll have bread that crumbles. We'll have constant hunger. Just terrible descriptions of all the terrible things that will happen to us. And indeed, as we know throughout our history, these things did happen to us when we did abandon God. If despite this, you will not heed me, the fifth series of punishments, if we behave towards God with casualness, he too will respond to us with a fury of casualness. He will chastise us seven ways for our sins. And it describes, again, very, very difficult to read it, but uh, cannibalism, parents eating the flesh of their of their children, there'll be such delirium amongst the populace, they'll consume the flesh of their own children. And we know, of course, throughout history, this did happen. Our defenses will crumble. People will die. The Almighty's presence will depart from us. The cities will be destroyed. Our land will be desolate. God will refuse to accept our offerings. There's a haunting story in the Talmud, in the book of Sanhedrin, where it describes, again, in verse 30, I will cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols. The Almighty is promising, if you have idolatry, if you disobey God, not only is your idol a carcass, it has no life, it has no vitality, but your carcass will fall upon the carcass of your idols. It tells a terrible story about Elijah. Elijah was walking through the destroyed cities of Judea and Jerusalem, and he finds a small child who was bloated with hunger and sitting in squalor. And he tried to get him to say Shema, to say the Shema, say, say the declaration of God. And right away, the kid pulls out an idol from his pocket and hugs it and kisses it until he dies. And the corpse of this child collapses on the idol, and that was a fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment, the ultimate personification of God promising, I will cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols. And indeed, when the Jewish people did immerse themselves in idolatry, these these promises were indeed fulfilled. But there is a little bit of a consolation here. I will make the land desolate. Rashi tells us that this is a little bit of a comfort for us because not only will we not be secure in the land, but the Gentiles won't flourish in it either. And I think it's a very powerful idea to read today. You know, we know we have thousands of years of history to look back upon. And the one land, the one country, the one region that has had the most turnover more than any other place, the most disputed piece of real estate in the world is, of course, the land of Israel. And this is the reason why, because it's really reserved for us But when we disobey God, we're bounced out of the land and the land becomes desolate because even the people that move in, even the new inhabitants of the land, they themselves don't really find themselves so secure in the land. And then in verse 34, we circle back to the concept of Shemitah that we read about last week. Then says the Torah, the land will be appeased for its its sabbaticals during all the years of its desolation. Rashi makes an amazing calculation that there were 70 years that the Jewish people did not obey the laws of Shemitah, and therefore the exile, the Babylonian exile, when the Jewish people kicked out of the land of Israel, it lasted for 70 years, the land was desolate, the land lay fallow to make up for the 70 years of Shemitah that the Jewish people disobeyed. And then it continues, again, very difficult to read, very painful, but very accurate when you look back at, at Jewish history. 
the survivors amongst you. I will bring weakness into their hearts in the land of their foes. Uh, the sound of a rustling leaf will pursue them. They'll be terrified. They will flee as one flees the sword, and they will fall, but without a pursuer. They will stumble over one another as in flight from the sword, but there is no pursuer, and you will not have the power to withstand your enemies. You will become lost amongst the nations, and the land of your foes will devour you because of their iniquity. Your remnant will disintegrate in the land of your foes, and because of the iniquities of your forefathers that are with them, they too will disintegrate. Very, again, very difficult to read, but again, something that we look back now over the course of history and find that indeed was fulfilled, uh, sadly. In verse 37 here, very important Rashi, you will stumble over each other in flight from the sword. So the Jewish people are going to be stumbling over each other and they're going to kind of injure each other because of the stampede away from the non-existent pursuer. But there's an interesting Rashi here. Rashi quotes the Midrash. The Midrash says that you will stumble over each other. Each one of you will suffer from the sins of your fellow. And this is an idea we find throughout the Torah that the Jewish people are aravim zelazeh. We are guarantors for one another. When someone, another Jew, does a sin, a sliver of that sin is given to every other Jew because we believe that really the Jewish nation is really one soul. We are really the soul of Adam. And therefore, there's interdependence and communal responsibility. And if we don't make sure that not only we are behaving properly, but our friends are, then we're going to be tripping over each other. Even if you are okay in a stampede, it doesn't matter that you're safe because you could be smothered by others. And then we finally are creeping out of this terrible description of, of what's going to happen to us. Then they will confess their sins. So then the Jewish people are going to get the message. They're going to confess. And the sin of the forefathers for the treachery with which they betrayed me and also for having behaved towards me with casualness, I too will behave with them to, towards them with casualness. The confession is not so sincere. It's not complete. And therefore God says, you still have casualness. And I'll bring them into the land of their enemies. Perhaps then their unfeeling heart will be humbled and then they will gain appeasement for their sin. I will remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham. I remember and I will remember the land. Even though their confession will not be complete, the Almighty says, okay, they're, they're going to confess and they're going to repent a little bit. I'm going to add the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and I'll remember the land. And the land will be appeased after having been desolate. And despite all of this, in verse 44, this is the, the, the grand consolation. While they will be in the land of their enemies, I will not have been revolted by them, nor will I reject them, nor will I obliterate them. I won't annul my covenant with them, for I am Hashem their God. I will remember for them the covenant of their ancestors those whom I, whom I have taken out of the land of Egypt, for the eyes of the nation, to be God unto them, I am Hashem. This is a very valuable consolation that even though the Almighty is going to punish us, and even though we have all these consequences, in the land of our enemies, the holiness that's within us is never going to be extinguished, and therefore God will never completely abandon us. Now, it is interesting, when God remembers the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, first of all, lists them backwards, Jacob, then Isaac, and then Abraham. And second of all, it says, I will remember my covenant with Jacob. I will remember my covenant with Abraham, whereas by Isaac, there's no reference to any remembrance. It doesn't say, I will remember my covenant with Isaac. So those two questions uh, Rashi asks. Why does it start from Jacob? Why does it count backwards, so to speak? Even if it was only because of Jacob, he would be enough to help propel the Jewish people out of their depths of despair. If God had only made a covenant with Jacob, that would be enough. Why does it not mention remembrance by Isaac? So Rashi says something very powerful. Rashi says, Isaac, he was the one who voluntarily offered to die for God. And therefore, that mitzvah, that act of martyrdom, of self-sacrifice, of 
of Isaac, there's no need to remember it. It's as if the ashes of Isaac's burned body are piled up in front of me, says God, so to speak, and I don't need to remember it. It's always there. When someone does an act of self-sacrifice, that mitzvah, so to speak, it engenders eternal merits, not only for them, but for their children. And it's almost as if it's always present before God. There's no need for God to invoke that. There's no need for God to remember that. It's always there. Very powerful idea. The chapter concludes, these are the decrees and the ordinances and the teachings that Hashem gave between himself and the children of Israel at Mount Sinai via Moses. And I think, you know, this chapter, looking back, it's a very difficult and painful chapter to read. But I think the overarching message is that we need to take to heart when bad things happen to us. Maybe God's sending us a message, number one. Number two, I think there is a heartening component to it, the realization that what God is saying is that he wants a connection with us. By hook or by crook, either we obey his Torah, either we toil in his Torah, we obey his mitzvot, and then it's a positive connection, or we disobey, and then there's still a connection, but the connection is one of consequences, one of punishment. And that, of course, is something we don't, we don't want, but if you look at the grand retrospective of, of Jewish history, it turns out that we're still around. And if we didn't have that connection, by hook or by crook, in any scenario, then we probably would not have survived all the upheavals of our history. Uh, the great anomaly of, of world history is the fact that the Jewish people, despite all hell that we have endured, all the expulsions and all the inquisitions and all the blood libels and all the exiles, despite all of that, we're still around. And this really is the secret. This is the key to our survival, the fact that God insists that we survive. That God insists that we have a connection with him. And while it's painful to have the connection in the event that we don't obey the laws, it's still preferable than us not existing entirely. Chapter 27 deals with various gifts to the temple, various donations, various sanctifications. And it begins, if someone pledges, makes a vow to donate to the temple coffers the value of a person. So if I say, okay, the value of this person, I'm going to donate. So how valuable is that person? So the verse breaks it down to men and women and in various stages of their life. Are they infants? Are they young people? Are they uh, mature people? Are they old people? And each one of them has a different value. And if someone is too poor, then the priest will evaluate how much they could pay via his disposable income and that's what you could pay. Very interesting law when someone makes a pledge, a donation to the coffers of the temple. I want to give the value of this person that would find out what category they fit in. Are they a man, are they a man or a woman, male or female? Are they an infant? Are they a small child? Are they a young person? Are they a mature person? Are they an old person? Each one has a different valuation. How many silver coins that the person has to pay? Now, the juxtaposition of the admonition and pledging the value of, of people is a very, Unusual connection. doesn't seem to be connected at all. The Baal Haturim says something fascinating. He says, if you count the amount of silver coins in each one of these groups, again, we said it's five different groups and male and female. So, for example, the valuation of a man between 20 and 60 is 50 silver coins. If it's a female, it's 30 silver coins. What if it's someone between the age of 5 and 20? And a male is 20 coins, and a female is 10 coins. If it's from the age of one month to five years, a male is five silver coins, a female is three silver coins. If it's above the age of 60, then it's a male is 15 coins, and a female is 10 coins. So, says the Baal Tum, if you count the amount of coins, all told, it's 143 silver coins. And then he tells us, if you count the amount of curses in the previous chapter, you have 45 curses. And in chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, the second time the Torah gives curses, it's 98 different curses. What's 98 plus 45? The total is 143. And therefore, you have 143 coins 
that parallels the 143 curses. And he, he explains is that the donations to the temple, i.e. charity to Torah causes, to causes for the Jewish people, those are the ways to rectify the underlying causes for the 143 curses. The Kliyakar, one of the commentaries on the Torah, he explains a very deep point. He explains that when someone makes a pledge, sometimes you're, someone's in a dire straits, they're in danger, and they say, you know what? If God saves me, I'm going to give a donation to charity, to, to, to Torah causes, to the temple, whatever it may be. And then things improve. There's a tendency for us to forget what we promised and maybe not pay those pledges. Things aren't so bad anymore. You kind of forget about how bad things were. And therefore, immediately after the terrible events of, of the last chapter are concluded, now things are okay, it reminds us, don't forget the donation that you pledged, don't forget to give it to charity. And then it talks about if someone pledges to give an animal towards the coffers, then the animal becomes sanctified, and in the event that the person wants to buy it back, they have to add a fifth. So if he redeems, he must add a fifth to the valuation. So someone donates a cow to the temple, and they say, you know what, I really miss Betsy, I want to have her back. You have to pay the value of the cow plus a fifth. However, Rashi tells us that if the owner wants to redeem it, then they pay a fifth. If someone else, a random person wants to buy that animal from the coffers of the temple, they don't need to add a fifth. They could just buy it at fair market value. And the obvious question is, is, shouldn't it be the opposite? After all, the owner, they themselves, with the magnanimity of their heart, they got up and they decided to donate their animal to the temple. So shouldn't we make it easier for them to redeem it? Why do we make it harder for them? They have to add a fifth. No one else needs to add a fifth when they want to buy livestock back from the temple coffers. So Rabbi Rucham answers, very powerful idea. The Midrash tells us that it's much worse to start a mitzvah and not finish it than to not start the mitzvah at all. And the Midrash couches this in very scary terms. Someone who starts a mitzvah but doesn't finish it ends up burying his wife and children. Meaning, just like if someone starts a mitzvah and doesn't finish it, someone will start to have a family but not finish it, not have the ability to finish it. Very, very scary. And therefore, same thing over here. You know, someone gets inspired to give a donation to the temple. And then they start regretting it. They're in very dangerous territory. They began their ascent. They began to make themselves holier. They decided to accept upon themselves something. And now they're having second thoughts about it. And therefore, specifically that person, we asked, okay, you want to buy it back? You have to give a fifth. You have to make sure that your magnanimity does not go in vain. You have to add a fifth towards the coffers of the temple. And then we read about if someone pledges to give their home to Hashem, to the coffers of the temple, how they redeem it. If someone wants to give their field and depends, was the field sanctified by someone else or by the original owner, the original ancestral owner, that determines whether or not it goes back to the original owner by the Yovel year. We read about the firstborn, the firstborn the, uh, amongst the livestock. So if you have a firstborn, that goes to the coffers of the temple, whether you like it or not. What if someone pledges the value of a condemned man, someone who did a crime, a capital crime, and is going to be executed, and someone pledges the value of that person, that is nothing. There's no need to redeem that because that person is put to death. We read about the laws of Miser Shani. Miser is the tithing. This is the second tithing. It's not a donation. Instead, someone needs to take those produce, uh, the grain, the wine, the oil, and bring it to Jerusalem, eat in Jerusalem, but they could redeem it. So when someone has a field, they have to give uh, 10%. They have to tithe. 10% goes to the Levite. A second 10%, they themselves eat it, but they have to eat it in Jerusalem. And if they want to redeem it, i.e. transfer the produce to money and bring the money to Jerusalem and use that money in Jerusalem, then they have to add a fifth. And finally, we read about the laws of Miser for animals, which is every 
Meister is a Hebrew word for tithing, which is every tenth animal is given as a donation. And the way it works, Rashi tells us that you have all the animals in, in a pen and you let them out one at a time and you count and every tenth one, you take a red paintbrush and you strike it and that one belongs to the, to the temple coffers. And it doesn't matter if it's a big one or a small one or a robust one. You can't play around with it. Don't distinguish between the good and the bad. Don't substitute not for good, not for bad. You have to just give every tenth one, whatever comes out, let it be random. And it's interesting, you know, that this is the format how it has to be done. You have all the animals in the pen, then you let them out one at a time, and you strike every tenth one. Why do you do it in that fashion? So I saw two excellent explanations. Some suggest that... You know, the Torah wants to make it easier. You have livestock. You're working hard with them. And every tenth you have to give to charity. It's very difficult. So what do you do? You put all the animals in a huge pen. And you say, oh, look how many animals I have. Oh, I have so many animals. It's no big deal to give every tenth one to to God. And similarly, we have to think of strategies how to make mitzvahs easier for us. And if that if that works, if looking at how much you have in aggregate, if it makes it easier for you to 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 mobilize yourself to give charity, then, then, then do it like that. Perhaps a second understanding is that when someone puts all their animals into the pen and then you let them out one at a time and every tenth one of them you pledge to give to God. Of course, you have some animals that are big and strong and robust, very valuable. And then you have the weak the frail, the feeble animals, and you put them all in the pen and you don't know which one's going to come out every tenth. You can't calculate which one's going to come out every tenth. You have 100, 200, 500 animals. You just, every tenth one you give to God. So when you do that, in effect, because you're committing to give whichever one comes out tenth, you're going to give them to God and every tenth and twentieth and thirtieth and fortieth, then it's as if you committed already to pledge the healthy, robust ones. And therefore, even if a frail one comes out, you get the reward as if you gave a robust one because that's what you would have done if a healthy, robust one came out. And finally, the Parsha concludes, and indeed the book of Leviticus concludes, these are the commandments that Hashem commanded Moses to the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. Chazak, chazak, let us be strong. Let us be strong. May we be strengthened. We are going to move on next week to the book of Numbers to Sefer Bamidbar and Parshas Bamidbar. My name is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I encourage everyone to share this podcast, the Parsha podcast with their friends and sample all the other podcasts that we offer here from Torch in Houston, Texas, the Jewish History Podcast, the Mitzvah Podcast, Eternal Ethics, Torah 101, this Jewish Life, and many more podcasts yet to come. I look forward to hearing from you, rabbiwolby at gmail.com.